Jeremiah chapter number 10, verse number 20. He says, My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. There's none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We sure do. Thank you for the good singing we enjoyed tonight. All three songs ministered to my soul. We thank you for the good congregational singing. Lord, it uplifted my soul. We thank you, Lord, for the reading of the Word of God. We're thankful we still have it. It's a privilege to have it. And we're certainly thankful, Lord, that we have your statutes and your precepts. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for the Word of God is a light unto our, our path, our feet, and, and a lamp unto our path. And God, we're so thankful for all that you've done. We thank you for the good testimony. We thank you, Lord, for uh, those that are working with our young people over on the other side. God, I pray you'd bless their efforts. And I pray for those precious young people. You'd put a hedge about their minds. And God, what they're learning from the Bible tonight will lodge deep in their heart and propel them over the obstacles and the wickedness of this world. And God, I pray you'd help our young people. And those working with the teens, I pray you'd bless their efforts. Uh, our teenagers face so many peer pressure and so many problems. And God, I pray you'd help those young people. And God, again, insulate them. And God, give them faith and strength. And God, use those young people for your honor and for your glory. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us from the Word of God tonight. I pray you once again use this unworthy vessel. Speak to your people. And God, I pray that, Lord, uh, unlike Jeremiah's day, your people would receive the Word of God with gladness. And, Lord, I pray to transform us into thy likeness. And, God, may we shine as bright lights in this dark and dispersed world that we live in today. Lord, get glory. Well, thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Here the Lord is lamenting through the prophet Jeremiah. He is remembering when Israel went after him in a wilderness in a land that was not sown. And Israel was glad to be redeemed. And Israel was glad for the goodness of God. Uh, but now there is no one to set up his tabernacle. There is no one to set up that that portable tabernacle that they took through the wilderness and, and to be a blessing and uh, to worship him and to appreciate him. And he's grieving that. But notice some things that he brings out. First of all, he brings out the spoiled tabernacle. He said, Woe is me for my hurt, verse 19. My wound is grievous, but I said, Truly this is a grief, and I must bear it. Why? My tabernacle is spoiled. He said, uh, and all my cords are broken. Uh, 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 he's uh, 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 lamenting over the fact he has a spoiled tabernacle. Can I say there was once a time when people thought the house of God was the most precious place on the block. Folks couldn't wait to get to church. But even today, churches are spoiled. We're no longer a shadow of what we used to be. What has spoiled the church today is prosperity. God has blessed us immensely, and uh, it is no longer a sacrifice uh, uh, to come to church. Now, I was raised in a church that had an old oil furnace. It didn't matter what the temperature was in the winter, you was cold at church. I mean, it had a tile floor, an oil f uh, furnace that uh, uh, belched, uh, 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 and it put out something, but it wasn't heat. Uh, can I say, uh, uh, the church I was raised in, if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to go outside. Uh, they had two out back, the brethren and the sisters. And the sisters was really blessed. Uh, they had two holes in there, huh? No light. Uh, I guarantee you there wasn't much toilet paper back. Now, what I'm saying is if you had to go in the middle of church service, you really had to go, huh? There wasn't no water fountain in the church I was raised in. Can I say there was no padded pews? Uh, 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 we had old pine pews when I was little. Uh, uh, you didn't slip down and go on to sleep in them things. You'd get splinters, huh? 
uh, uh, listen, uh, 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 the church I was raised in, we had the old crank out windows and the, and the funeral fans. That was your air conditioning in the summer. Uh, 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 we didn't have a whole lot. The offerings weren't real big. Uh, 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 the number of people, uh, 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 you, you had brag boards back then, and uh, uh, the numbers of the people wasn't what some of the big churches uh, brag about today. We didn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, prosperous things as the way the world uh, uh, looks at it. But one thing that little old church had, it had a whole lot of God. Uh, I'd rather have a whole lot of God in this day and age uh, than to have all the conveniences of life. Uh, I remember Brother James walking in the back doors uh, and folks be gathered around uh, 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 the uh, piano and they'd be singing and all of a sudden more people join in with them. Uh, and church would break out before church actually started. Uh, 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 today we gather in the vestibule uh, and we talk about all kinds of things about the world. Uh, we don't come to worship anymore because prosperity has ruined us. Mm -hmm. Boy, that hit real good. Uh, truth's truth, whether you like it or not. Hmm? Uh, what a difference our church would be if we didn't gather out there, if we'd gather in here and folks would pray, and folks get to singing around the piano, uh, folks get in tune with God before uh, uh, church actually starts. Uh, there was times, uh, you can ask my Aunt Lynn, there was times we'd come in on Sunday morning, sometimes we'd have Sunday school first, sometimes we wouldn't. Sometimes it gets so good before church started uh, uh, and, and folks get to worship and my granddaddy just had them all sit down and start preaching. Hmm? You say, what happened? We had sinners get saved back in those days. Uh, uh, if folks wasn't getting saved, the altar was full with people begging God, am I the reason why folks aren't getting saved? Uh, they would pray that because they was bringing sinners with them. Hmm? Today, we're so prosperous, we think that uh, nobody needs God. Hmm? We're spoiled by prosperity. We're spoiled by pride. We won't get in the altar and say, God, am I the reason the hand of God's not falling on the church like it used to? We're full of pride. We think we got the, we got the corner of the market this thing. We, we, we're quick to blame somebody else. Huh? It's Ray and Randy's fault. They wore pink today. God can't bless when men wear pink, huh? Well, we come up with all kinds of reasons rather than look at ourselves. The middle letter, pride, is the, word, is the letter I. And that's our problem. Hmm? Well, the tabernacle spoiled by presumption. We presume we know everything. Hmm? We presume that we're right with God. And so when uh, uh, the service takes hold, we tune it out because we think we're already okay. God help us, huh? We see a spoiled tabernacle. He, he not only mentions that, knows he mentions strayed children. Look what he says, verse 20. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. How many of us know people that are used to bees? They used to come to church. They used to teach. Uh, they used to be a deacon. They used to sing in a the choir. They used to, used to, used to. But tonight they are not. Hmm? I wonder how many churches in America could be filled tonight if those that once did would do again. We talked about that a little bit in my Sunday school class this morning where people have gotten their eyes off the Lord and gotten their eyes on something else that has caused them end up in a hog pen somewhere they don't know that he will let them come back home they're strayed children hmm. can I say that I think one of the most heinous and horrible things that there could be in this earth is where parents and children no longer fellowship or get along that would be horrible hmm that's one of the things we enjoy most about holidays or any day is getting together with our children. Huh? We spend a day together and, and hang out. We love it. We even love the fact Christian don't want to leave. He just hangs out. Huh? Finally, Taylor said, we got to go. Huh? We love it. Huh? And they love it. They love it when Nets already got the cookies in the oven. They love it. Huh? Today I was going to eat a Swiss roll or something, and, and Sydney says, oh, Mom made brownies and cookies. I said, bring them on, sister. 
Huh? He said, what are you trying to say? I can't imagine not having any fellowship with my children. What do you think God thinks? When he's redeemed some, and they no longer fellowship with him. Now, they've all got excuses, Brother Dong. They want to blame you or me or somebody why they don't come. But the fact of the matter is they're hurting God, which in fact is hurting them. Hmm? And I realize some don't come because they're embarrassed. They know they've walked away from the goodness of God. The reality is they haven't come to themselves in the hog pen yet. They're still satisfied feeding from the swine. They get, t they get sick of that, they'll come back home. But we see that he's dealing with a spoiled tabernacle. He's dealing with strayed children, but he's also dealing with service that is neglected. Look what he says. There's none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. Hmm? How much work for God is not getting done today? Because there's nobody to do it. Hmm? Our church is very unique. Most churches, 90% of the work gets done by 10% of the people, and of the 10% of the people, most of it's the pastor, his wife, and his family. That's not the case here. We got folks all over this church that's doing something, and that's a blessing. But that's not the case everywhere. There's a lot of work that still could be done out of this church if folks would get busy and do it. Mm -mm. Yeah, said, well, I'm waiting on a license. Well, what do you, you got the Bible. God said, go do it, go do it. Huh? And yet, there's so much service being neglected. The Lord's looking for somebody to do something. Did he not tell Isaiah that he's looking for a man to stand in the gap, make up the hedge? Huh? Huh? How many in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and how many times is God calling for somebody to do something? Hmm? And here's the problem. Let me go over here and talk to the nuts. I mean the M&Ms. Here's the problem. We want to do something if it's something big. Or if it's something that we'll get some notoriety for. It. Hmm? We don't want to do something, Brother Ray, if nobody's going to see it. Or if it's not, not something real big that we'll get recognized for. I remind you, God's into little things. Hmm? No? He's into little details, the little things. And by the way, he takes those base things and confounds the wise. Hmm? Sure, everybody will sign up if it's something big. But I find most of the time when it's something big, God's usually not in it. Hmm? All he's asking for is somebody to set up his, his, his tent. Somebody to... Uh, set up his curtains. Somebody do something so others can see the effects of it, but never see it. I preached a message a long time ago in the old building on the feller in the cellar. A fellow by the name of Joash down there in the cellar, he's stomping out those olives so they can have oil for the lamps. Nobody saw him down there in the cellar, but everybody saw the effect of his work down there in the cellar because there was light in the tabernacle. See, nobody wants to be that fellow in the cellar. Huh? Everybody wants to be on the stage. Everybody wants to have their name on the marquee. God's looking for some fellers in the cellar. Mm -hmm. Somebody's just going to roll up their sleeves and do some work. Mm -hmm. Now, none of that's the message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm interested where he says, My cords are broken. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, ropes are to be strong. Ropes are to be steady. They're to be supportive. You can count on them to bear the load. Have you ever seen some of them real big ropes that are tied to, to beams and tied to anchors and tied to things that hold things together? That's what ropes were meant to be. And yet, once trustworthy ropes are broken. I don't preach on this thought tonight. I don't preach on ropes of sand. Ropes of sand. They're no longer strong and steady. They're no longer things you can count on. They're sinking and they're turning to dust. Ropes of sand. There are things that once you could count on. Things that once were pillars. But today they're sinking sand. 
they do not bear the load. They do not hold the weight. They do not withstand any pressure. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, I'll tell you one rope of sand is a society without law and order. A society without law and order is, is of none effect. Used to, our societies were strong because America was a nation of laws. America was a nation based on a constitution. It was based on liberty. It was based on all the citizens having the same rights and all the citizens living by the same laws. But we live in a society that doesn't have law and order anymore, and a society that doesn't have morals anymore. A society where our judges can be bought for the highest bidder. A society where our politicians are career-minded, uh, where they enter into office having some, but they leave having m a m massive amounts. Uh, 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 I, I just seen where Nancy Pelosi is uh, worth over $100 million. How did she gain $100 million making uh, $175,000 a year? She's awful old. I know she's old, but to make that kind of money, she's really old. She's been around since Noah. Huh? i tell you how they make that kind of money. They're crooks. Their votes are up for sale. That's what happens. And when you have a society that is no longer based on law and order, no longer based on, on fundamental rights, my dear friends, it is ropes of sand. It will not last very long. And by the way, this country is going to fall. I know you don't like to hear that, but in order for there to be a one-world government, America has to cease being what America's been. And whether or not you understand it or not, in the last two years, America has ceased uh, what she used to be. Matter of fact, the last 20 years, America's not what she once was. Uh, uh, the first George Bush was calling for a new world order. The second George Bush uh, uh, signed the Patriot Act, uh, stripping us of a lot of our liberties. Uh, Obama uh, spit on the Constitution, and Joe Biden don't even know if there is one, my dear friends. Uh, we're headed to be a nation that's no longer a nation. America is a rope of sand. America that once had a matchless constitution was the envy of the world is now the laughing stock of the world. And it's all by design because the globalists think they know better than the common man. Can I say a society without law and order is a rope of sand? Can I say a sanctuary without the power of God? is ropes of sand. Used to, the sanctuary had the power of God. Used to, sinners didn't want to come because they knew they were not right with God. And now folks can come, not be right with God, and leave the same way they came. Can I say the sanctuary loses the power of God when the Bible is no longer preached? Mm -mm. I'm glad I don't have to apologize for preaching the Bible. But there are folks that come here from other places that don't preach the Bible, and they're in shock. Mm -hmm. Folks ought to be in shock if the preacher's not preaching the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet, uh, when the Bible is no longer preached, uh, then people are left to live to their own conceits, and my dear friends, that always leads them away from God. Mm -hmm. Can I say the sanctuary loses the power of God when it's not bathed in prayer? Prayer is where the power comes from. We could quit praying for God to show up, and guess what? He'll, he'll no longer show up. He'll stamp it about on it, and this church will be like many other churches. is just a museum of what it once was. Hmm? Can I say? The sanctuary loses the power of God when the brethren become pugnacious, divided, full of discord. Hmm? And by the way, that's been by design. How many of you know churches that have two services on Sunday morning? Have an early service and a late service? Three of us. Huh? Hmm? Uh, you know why they do that? They used to say they'd do that so they wouldn't have to build another building. You know why they do that? They do that to meet the desire of people wanting to get out and be at the Cracker Barrel earlier than other people. To have all afternoon to do fleshly things rather than worship. Here's the problem. When you have the congregation split like that, you can never be in accord. The Bible says that the church is to be in unity. Be of the same mind. Be of one accord. How can we be one accord when we're never assembled together? Hmm? Huh? There's been some, some, some things that have uh, 
been inserted by the devil that people bought into, thought they were great, uh, and all it does is it erodes what God wanted established in his local church. i tell you another Has anybody ever heard this term, junior church? I made somebody want me to call their name. You, you, most of you know the name, know the person. I made somebody matter in a wet hen. We're going to have junior church. I said, we're going to have a junior preacher. Yeah. We're going to have a junior song leader. We're going to have a junior piano player. We're going, we're going to have junior songbook. We're going to have preaching for the juniors. So I know we was going to teach them a little lesson, get them some coloring books, and, and get them some cookies and Kool-Aid and all that and, and everything. I said, but that ain't junior church. That's kindergarten. If you're not going to have a preacher, then it's not church. I said, if they need church, we got plenty of it right out here in the sanctuary. No? Uh, say they want to have a babysitting club. Hmm? Now, we teach them on, on every other Sunday night over there. We're teaching them on their level. We're putting a Bible in them. We're making them uh, uh, study the Bible, learn the Bible, memorize the Bible. And you know what has happened? A lot of them's gotten saved that way. Mm-mm. Uh, but I have never been an advocate of taking them out of the sanctuary. Hmm? When I came up, we didn't have a nursery. We didn't even have toilets. Done told you that. You think we had a nursery? Huh? They acted up. There's times I acted up. There was a good remedy for that. Mama would take them out, wear them out, bring them back in, dare them to breathe. That straightens them out. By the way, some of you parents, if you'd learn to biblically discipline your children, you wouldn't have the problems you've got. Mm -mm. Huh? I learned early on, you don't back, back talk mama. You know why my lips are so fat? I got smacked in the mouth a lot of times. They're still swollen. Mm -mm. Uh, I got smacked in the mouth one time by calling a preacher by his first name. Never did that again. Uh-uh. No, I didn't do that. He said, no, that's brother so-and-so. Uh, you can call a preacher by his first name. There's a lot of things I got smacked in the mouth over. You had to know me. You've probably figured it out. Huh? Miss Jackie, she said something about the other day about Ivy making so much noise. I told her, I said, I can scream a whole lot louder than she can. So that don't bother me. I'd rather have a baby in here. Huh? You know what happens? They start figuring out things. How many babies have you heard say, Amen? Huh? And you know what else they figure out? They figure out there's something special when people come to this altar. Huh? They don't understand it all. They just know something about it. And they know there's something special about the preacher because everybody gets real quiet and listens to him while he's preaching. They don't understand what he's saying. They don't understand what everything, but they're learning things. Uh, and by the way, uh, you raise them up in the house of God and they'll get saved at a young age because they realize uh, as they're growing and things start making sense to them, they start asking questions. Uh, next thing they want to know is what it means to be saved. Uh, and then their little tender hearts, the Lord touches them. They get saved by the good grace of God. Uh, and what a blessing to see that. They don't get that coloring pictures of Moses. Hmm? Yeah. You're welcome. That didn't cost you anything. Huh? By the way, when the kids aren't here, you can, you can rest assured, if you don't already know this, the Bible's being put in them. Yeah. We don't do anything that the Bible's not a part of it. Huh? Yeah. Everything's centered around the Bible because the Bible's the absolute and final authority of our lives. And if we're not teaching them the Bible, then we're not doing anything. Yeah. But can I say... When the brethren become divided and full of discord, the power of God leaves. And can I say there's a great push by the devil to drive wedges between people. One of the jewels of our church is how many families love one another and do things socially. That's a blessing. Huh? What a blessing for that crowd that shows up early and stays late. That's a blessing. You'll find some of the best friends you'll ever have on earth is in this building. Hmm? Uh, you say, well, I don't have many friends. The Bible says you want to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. You want to have friends, be a friend. Hmm? Uh, and God help us when we start letting the devil put wedges between people. Huh? But can I say the sanctuary loses its power when the beloved Son of God is no longer praised? Uh it's all about Him. And when it ceases to become all about Him, you no longer have a church. All you got is a social club. Huh? 
Can I say a sanctuary without the power of God is a rope of sand? Can I say a salvation without any change? That's a rope of sand. Hmm? If, if Jesus can't save you and deliver you from your sin, then what kind of Savior is he? Huh? Did you all hear what Donald said a little bit ago? He was praising God. He wasn't one that got a DUI last night. Because what you don't know and what I do know is he had a little problem with alcohol until he met Jesus. And he met Jesus. And guess what? He started drinking from another well. Hmm? Uh, you will talk to him. He'll tell you he tried to quit on his own. He couldn't do it. And neither could you. You couldn't quit your sin on your own. But aren't you glad that when Jesus saves somebody, he breaks the chains of sin? Aren't you glad he not only forgives you, uh, but he gives you the power over it? What a blessing. Uh, hey, that doesn't mean when somebody gets saved that instantly they get a halo. Uh, uh, some people struggle with some things for a little while. Uh, but the more they let the Lord do a work in their heart, uh, 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 God will deliver them from every vice, by the way. Huh? I've dealt with two preachers in the last couple weeks who's dealing with young ladies who've been married to fellows with porn addictions who have abused them. And I'm talking about people in churches. I'm talking about people in fundamental independent Baptist churches. I'm talking about there's so many wicked things going out there. You say, preacher, how can that happen? Well, if... Yeah, first of all, i got a whole lot of problem with maybe they're not saved. But if they are saved, they spend a whole lot more time sowing seed to the flesh than they do the Lord. Because the Lord can break every chain and every vice, my dear friends. Huh? Listen, there's a lot of things happening in this world. you got to praise God for the blessings of God on your life. And you've heard me say it often. You don't know the pain behind a lot of smiles when people come to church. You don't know what people are going through. That's why you, know, you need to be good to people. You need to be kind to people. You need to love on people. There, there, are, there are people come to church and maybe their spouses don't come with them or their family don't come with them. And, and I know Miss Brenda Corbin, when she used to come, she'd have to fight hell all the way to church. And she's in a wheelchair, and her husband would just shove her through the door and roll her in. And, and can I say, she'd, she'd have to fight hell all the way here. And she'd get here, and she'd have the sweetest disposition and the sweetest countenance. Uh, 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 and I never forget going uh, 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 up to the hospital and talking with her after he had beaten her. Uh, and she's laying there in the hospital bed, and we're talking to her. And I'm, I'm trying to be as spiritual as I can be, but inside of me, you don't want to know what I was thinking. Uh, I just know about 50 years ago, Brother Clint, some of us get rounded up. We'd go solve the problem ourselves. Uh, uh, but listen... Uh, I, I got to talking to her and Miss Nett got to talking to her uh, and this is what she said uh, she said I know if I leave him he'll have no gospel witness uh, so I stay with him in hopes uh, that he'll get to know Jesus now, that's a godly person right there I'm telling you and she used to make him matter in a wet hen he'd be in there trying to drink and she'd have preaching on and she'd have it cranked uh, she's in heaven tonight but I'm just trying to tell you, you don't know what people go through. So when they come to the house of God, they need to experience the love of Christ. They need to find some kindness. But I want to tell you something. A salvation without change, that's a rope of sand. I just, I just don't buy into this stuff, come as you are and leave as you are. Come as you are. Jesus bids everybody to come. But you study the Bible. From the time when the shepherds came to the time when the, uh, uh, the rulers came, when he was uh, two years old, and from everybody in the Gospels that came to Jesus, they always left a different way. Nobody ever came to Jesus and stayed the same unless they didn't give him his heart. Pharisees stayed the same. Sadducees stayed the same. The scribes stayed the same. The Herodians stayed the same. But anybody that came to Jesus seeking him as Lord left a different way. And can I say, still the same today. Somebody comes to Jesus and truly give them a heart, give their heart and repentance and faith to Christ, He changes their life. Hmm? Salvation without any change, it's just rope of sand. Can I say this? A sect or religion 
without grace is just a rope of sand. Can I say most denominations and religions may use some of the same terminology we use. But if you look at what they teach and you listen to what they have to say and you read their literature, all their religion is predicated on your works. Hmm. Works can't save us. If works could save us, why did Jesus have to die that horrible death on the cross? Hmm. The only thing to save us is grace, the unmerited favor of God. And can I say this? I was in a, in a, in a, at a funeral service not long ago and heard the, the preacher say about the deceased, he knew that the deceased was in heaven because the deceased got baptized. Baptism won't send you to heaven, friend. If you don't get saved, you're just a wet sinner. That's all you are. Huh? Can I say the only thing that will save you is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And all these tenets of religion, all they preach is works. The vineyard up here used to, on hot days, they'd be out there handing water out, trying to earn their way to heaven. The Emmanuel Methodist Church, I can't for the life of me remember what that Methodist church's name was before they had the church split, and then they changed it to Emmanuel. I promise you, I believe in my heart, they changed it to Emmanuel because so many of them got so much of our literature on their doors, they thought, well, we'll just change their name to Emmanuel, maybe them folks will come here. But anyway, uh, uh, they're over there giving out meals every day of the week trying to earn their way to heaven. There are folks that are all the time, uh, uh, the Catholics uh, have to take the wafer to earn their way to heaven. Everybody's giving money to earn their way to heaven. Can I say uh, there's not enough money in the million worlds to earn your way to heaven. Uh, the only way to heaven is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, sect without grace is just a rope of sand. Can I say shepherds or pastors that don't meet the qualifications of the Bible are ropes without sand. We got men standing behind the pulpits that do not meet the qualifications that God laid out there in, in the book of Timothy. Uh, why do you think God gave us the qualification for a bishop? So we know who to meet the qualifications. But we got double married preachers. We got preachers that aren't blameless and uh, 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 have horrible credit and have all kinds of problems in their life. Uh, 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 have left a long trail of destroying churches down through the uh, 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 the counties and through the state. Uh, all kinds of things they don't meet the qualifications, and yet people put them in because they have charisma. You can have charisma, don't mean you have Christ. Mm. And yet, shepherds that don't meet the qualifications are ropes without sand. There's a reason why some churches aren't blessed. If they're preaching the true word of God and they're not blessed, there's, there's several reasons. Hmm? God blesses churches that are evangelistic-minded. Churches get the gospel out. God blesses churches that are mission-minded that supports and gets the gospel through the whole world. And God blesses churches that take care of their pastor. God blesses churches where the pastor's been placed there by God. God blesses certain things. Yet when the people don't listen to the man of God, God won't bless it. When the people uh, 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 think they know more than God, God's not going to bless it. But you, you put in somebody who's not right with God, God's not going to bless it. You do things contrary to the Bible, God's not going to bless it. Mm -mm. And shepherds without meeting the qualifications, my dear friends, they're ropes of sand. Can I say service or ministries without authority are ropes without sand? Can I say everything that calls itself a ministry is an ordained of God? You know, we don't understand that. We hear ministry, we think they're doing something for God. And that's not always the case. How can I say this in a short period of time so I can get done with this message? Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. The only thing with authority is the church. Can I say, in and by myself, I have no biblical authority. I am the under-shepherd of this local assembly. Anything that I do without this local assembly sanction is my own selfish means and it has no biblical authority. Anything that bypasses the local church and is not sanctioned by the local church has no authority. It's very, very simple. 
the church has the authority. So if all of a sudden Brother Clint decides he wants to start a singing ministry and he quits coming to church and he runs up and down the road singing all over the place, he has no biblical authority. And by the way, this church wouldn't sanction him to have a singing ministry, run up and down the roads and never come to church because you can't show me in the Bible where God gave singers as a gift to the local church. I can show you in Ephesians chapter 4 who he gave his gifts. He gave teachers and he gave uh, uh, apostles and he gave uh, uh, pastors and he gave, you know, those that preach and teach the word for the perfecting of the saints. That's the gift to the local church, not singers. Let me help you with something. Singing is not a calling from God. It's a gift. It's a talent. And you use your, you're to use your talents in the local church. Mm. You're not to use your talents to make a name for yourself and get a bus. That's a rope of sand. Can I say that starting an evangelistic ministry that bypasses the local church is not of the Lord? It has no authority. Hmm? There's a whole lot of guys running up and down the road and got their face on a bus calling themselves evangelists, and they're not of God. They have no biblical authority to do what they're doing. They'll put up a tent and have people come out and do their deal, but they're not tied to a local church. They have no biblical authority. Let me help you with something. This is going to blow some people's minds, Brother Ray. I'd say it knocks some hair off your head, but we don't have to worry about that. When you study Ephesians chapter number 4 and you study the gifts of God to the church, there's one thing they're missing that we are well aware of. It's the term missionary. The term the Bible uses for what we call a missionary, the Bible uses the term evangelist. An evangelist, biblically, is a church planner. Somebody that would go to an area start witnessing and plant a church and he's been sent out of another local church to plant a church in that area that is a missionary but we've got a lot of guys running around calling themselves evangelists they never go out and knock on a door they never present the gospel they just go from church to church preaching the same five messages and getting a love offering they have no biblical authority there's a lot of folks don't understand the bible but there's a lot of people in this day and age that they accept anything. I made this statement about 10 years ago. Sidney Weaver stole it. He's used it all over the country, and everybody thinks it's his statement, but it's my statement, and he'll tell you that when he's here next time, and he'll tell you he stole it. Most of what is being preached in our churches is less than 70 years old. I can read everything Jesus preached. I can read everything Paul preached. I can read everything that Peter preached. I can read what James and John and Luke preached. I used to have, and I, I, I gave it to a young preacher, I used to have 63 volumes of everything Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached. I can read it every message that he preached in his ministry. I can go online and do that today. I can go online and read a lot of things that were preached in the early church and a lot of things, but what is mostly preached today is less than 70 years old. We're preaching what uh, some ideologies that came out of Bible colleges that these guys came up with, and that's what's being preached, and that's what's been sold to our churches, and people are sitting there, there's no power of God because they're holding on to a rope of sand. Isn't it amazing Jesus didn't tell preachers he had to wear a white shirt, but preachers tell you you have to wear a white shirt. Hmm. Isn't it amazing that Jesus didn't spend a whole lot of time dealing with how people should dress, but that's what most preachers deal with today. Hmm? Hmm. Matter of fact, they brought one woman to Jesus stark naked. He never even, Brother James, I've read that a hundred times. He never once told her, go put some clothes on. Yeah. He told her, go and sin no more. Right. He said, well, you're accusers. She said, I have none. And I have none. He said, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Right. Huh? They wanted to stone her. Jesus forgave her. Hmm? But can I say there's a lot of people that are swallowing camels and straining at gnats and calling it preaching. They have no biblical authority. 
that's why you got to understand the beauty of the Bible. Huh? Can I say this? God will never put somebody in a position of authority till they submit to authority. Hmm? Huh? I'll never forget when I knew I was going to have to find a home church and I just surrendered to preach and my granddaddy counseled me. He said, you, you get on the coattails of a good pastor. He said, you'll learn more from a pastor than you will at Bible college. And that's what he told me. He said, you follow that man, you do what he says, and keep your mouth shut. Can you imagine that? Tell me that. No. To this day, I do not call Brother Pittman Brother Junior. He's my pastor. I call him Brother Pittman. To this day, if he called me up, and he's, he's retired from the ministry. If he called me up and he said, I believe you need to do this, I'd do it. I respect for him. Because he proved himself to be a man of God in my life. But yet, I've had young preachers come through and I say, you know what, I think you ought to focus on this. And they get mad at me. Because they know more than me. Huh? I don't know much, but I have been at this a little while. But there's a lot of people who want to do things without biblical authority. It's just ropes of sand. You know why a lot of churches don't do anything? They're just ropes of sand. Hmm? Uh, they just do it as a social thing instead of a spiritual thing. Well, you're all about to pass out. I've done blown a lot of people's minds with stuff you never heard and stuff you're not sure about. And you got offended when I patted Ray on the head. You know my Sunday school class, I mentioned Benny Hill. Brother James, nobody knew who Benny Hill was. Do you know who Benny Hill is? Okay, yeah. No, that's Benny Hinn. That's Dr. Phil's friend. He was on in the 70s. It was a British sitcom. He's this fat guy, and, and, he, and he spoke this satire that you couldn't really understand half of what he was saying because he was from over on the other side of the old country. But he had this little short, bald-headed guy, and he's always time patting him on the head. Uh, that's Brother Ray. He's the guy I always pat on the head. Uh, but people didn't know who Benny... He, thank you, Brother Bob, for raising your hand. You know. I realized I'm old, uh, and I watched way too much television as a young man. I was telling him I saw it on one of them channels that nobody ever watches. I was flipping channels one night and then Benny Hill was on. I said, well, let me, I want to check. That was a stupid show. No wonder it went off air. I thought, what was you thinking? You wasn't even on drugs and you watched that stuff. What is crazy, huh? What can I say? There's a lot of people caught up in a lot of crazy stuff. And we wonder why God doesn't bless our churches. The last thought of a rope of sand is a soul without hope. A soul without hope is just a rope of sand. If you've got that blessed hope in your life, you are definitely the minority, but you are so blessed to know that you're saved, to know that heaven's your home, and to have that hope to have hope you're going to see your loved ones who are saved again. Can I say, I'm tired of going to funerals and they talk everybody into going to heaven. Hmm? Guy drank like a fish, cussed like a sailor, and never entered the doors of church, but um, bless God you're going to see him again. I hope not. He's in hell. I don't want to see him again. Huh? But can I say, a soul with no hope? You know why Jesus gave us the gospel? You know why Jesus died? So that every man could have this hope. You could be saved. And yet, you watch somebody's team lose. And you watch and see how much hope there. I got tickled this morning. I forget who it was now. Somebody said something to, to Zachary about, you know, UK beating Louisville yesterday. He didn't even know about it. I thought, you know what? I like that kid. Huh? He's the Cardinal. Didn't even know they got their tails handed to him yesterday. Huh? But I know there's some Louisville fans. <clears throat> that's going, not me. I wrote them off. <laughs> I would have too. What are they, like 2 and 40? Yeah, huh? They're not going nowhere this year, huh? But listen, if somebody loses again. I want to tell you something. If the Bengals lose Monday night, this, this, this country, this city's going crazy. I keep hearing about number one seed. There's a little problem with that. Kansas City would have to lose, and Kansas City's playing two cupcakes. They're not losing, okay? 
And then I keep hearing about Joe Burrow being the MVP. There's only one problem. Patrick Mahomes and, and, and Allen and all these other guys. That people have lost their minds over sports. That's where all their hope lies. Because their lives are so miserable they have nothing else to hope in. Aren't you glad regardless of who wins on Sunday, we win in it all? I've read the back of the book. We win. We have a hope. No, I haven't watched much college football this year. I really haven't. Now, I watched some of them games last night. I now know why I don't watch college football. They don't know how to play defense. Ohio State had that game won last night about 12 times and then they handed it to them. Said, here, you can have it. We don't want it. Huh? And how's the guy a kicker miss a, miss a field goal that bad? Did you see it? He missed it. 50 yards right. I'm thinking, what in the world? But there are people who lost their minds over that. Because that was all their hope. Huh? Cody Zorn's happy. Huh? But can I say, when you have no real hope, that you have to have artificial hope just to get to Friday so you can get drunk, that's sad. And that's what our society's become. And it may not be alcohol. People are addicted to all kinds of things. And it's because they don't have any true hope. I'm glad I have Jesus, aren't you? I'm glad I know that I know that I know that I know I've been saved. I'm glad to know that when this thing's over, come what may, heaven's going to be my home. Huh? We sang them great congregational songs that were so uplifting. Hmm? We do have mansions over the hilltop. We do have a desire to see him because that's our hope. I heard a preacher preach one time that too many people drive stakes too deep in this world. We're just passing through. We're pilgrims and strangers because our hope's on the other side. Those that don't have that hope a soul without hope is just a rope of sand. If we really take inventory about what most people are energized by in this world, they're just ropes of sand. They will not support them. They will not sustain them. So God has left you and I to be beacons of light so they can see there are ropes that will sustain and will hold <laughs> There are fundamentals that are true and that will change their lives. So I, I exhort you to do this. Just be all Christ would have you to be. Because people need hope. People need help. Churches need to be encouraged that there's still churches still doing it the right way and God's a blessing. They need to see that. Because too many are looking around and not seeing much at all. God help us to just be satisfied with the status quo. I want all that God's got for us, don't you? So don't be a rope of sand. And don't trust in ropes of sand. Trust in truth and light and things that will sustain you forever. And you'll not be easily dissatisfied. All right, I'm done. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. Maybe you want to come and thank God you got the truth. Maybe you want to come and tell them you love him. Maybe the Lord's put somebody on your heart. You want to go and tell them you love them and you're thankful. They're, they're somebody God's put in your life and been a help to you. So let's all stand. They're picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for those things that are secure. We're thankful we have an anchor steadfast and sure within the veil. We're thankful for our blessed hope, and we're thankful for the house of God that you allow us to come and assemble and worship. We're thankful for those things you have put your hand on that are authored by thee and have authority of God. Lord, we pray for those that are trusting in ropes of sand. We're thankful for those that seek you, but Lord, we fret over those that don't care. So God, help us to be the light and the salt and 
everything you'd have us to be this world that folks will come to know you before it's everlasting too late. Blessing this invitation. Have your will and way amongst us. Speak to hearts. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.